Good morning, everyone. Welcome to week eight in our current topics of genome analysis series. I'm pleased to introduce to you today Dr. Karen Mulkey, who will be presenting the lecture on genome-wide association studies. Dr. Mulkey is an NHGRI alumna, having done her, pos her postdoc work in Frances Collins's lab, where she used genome-wide approaches to localize diabetes susceptibility genes. She's currently an associate professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of North Carolina, a member of the Carolina Center for Genome Sciences, and also a member of the Linda Berger Comprehensive Cancer Center at UNC. Her lab studies complex, uh, in, studies complex traits with complex inheritance patterns. Using many of the approaches she'll be presenting to you today to study connections such as type 2 diabetes and obesity. It's always a pleasure to have Karen here with us at the NIH, and please join with me in wel welcoming her to NIH this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I have no uh, financial relationships or commercial interests. So we're going to talk today about the genetic basis of complex diseases and traits. And by complex diseases and traits, I mean those for which multiple genes are contributing to, towards susceptibility, for which variants may be common or they may be rare or both, for which there may be interactions between the, the variants and various environmental exposures. When we think about the genetic architecture of human uh, disease susceptibility variants. There's a range of the allele frequency that may be responsible or contribute towards a trait or disease. This can range from the very rare up through common frequencies. Here's 5 percent and higher. Variants also range in the strength of the effect that they have. Uh, some variants contribute a very small amount towards an influence on a trait or disease, and some are um, have a quite strong effect, for which if you inherit that variant, you uh, say for, for an autosomal dominant trait to may become affected. Many of the common disease and common trait variants that have been identified uh, most recently are, are due to common variants. And the technologies that have been used to identify these uh, are genome-wide association studies most recently. We're going to spend most of the time today talking about uh, genome-wide association studies that are detecting these common variants. And then to, at the end, we'll talk a little bit more about how uh, the increasing availability of sequencing to identify lower and lower frequency variants is moving us um, up the scale. Now, a lot of the variants that are contributing to common traits and common diseases have a relatively small effect. Inheriting a risk allele for height uh, may change one's height by a very small amount, as opposed to a, uh, you know, thinking fractions of millimeters instead of centimeters. So they're relatively low or modest on the effect size scale. The approach to identifying variants that contribute to a disease or a trait is similar between uh, linkage analysis in families as well as in uh, population-based analysis as is used in association studies. So in a family with a rare autosomal dominant disorder, uh, the goal of mapping is to trace the uh, alleles that are present in the affected members of the family. They hear the A1 allele inherited by all those members of the family. Association studies use this concept, but on a much longer time scale. So if here is today, and the uh, copies of the chromosome that we're able to measure and ascertain uh, currently, uh, compared to the many generations back to uh, common ancestors, a variant that arose around here that is inherited by uh, the individuals uh, that are descendant from that uh, in person. Maybe all of these individuals may be carrying a, a risk allele that is increasing their susceptibility to a trait, and we'll identify uh, variants uh, here compared to those individuals that don't carry it. So the goals of using a genome-wide association study are to test a large proportion of the, uh, the common genetic variation that's in the genome for association with disease susceptibility or variation in a quantitative trait. And uh, we can identify the variants that contribute to these uh, diseases or traits without having any idea what the underlying genes do, what the functions of those products are, doing it based on just the map position in the genome. And this approach, genome-wide association studies, has been very successful. This map of all of the uh, chromosomes from 1 uh, through 22 plus the X and Y shows with uh, various dots 
uh, representing loci that have been identified for various classes of uh, traits or diseases uh, and their positions in the genome. It's an outline of what we'll talk about today. First is going through the genomide association study design and some uh, concepts of the uh, facts that are important or the strategies that are important in setting up a study and uh, performing the study and aspects of the uh, analysis. And then uh, I'll show a few examples and talk about interpretation of the results, the effect size, the significance level, and some example loci and what their characteristics are. And then towards the end, we'll talk about movement towards uh, performing sequencing studies to look at uh, lower frequency variants or just otherwise uh, the way that association studies with lower frequency variants and rare variants uh, has different needs in terms of analysis. So doing a genome-wide association study, the study design depends on whether you have a disease or a trait. If it's a disease, one could do a case control association study. Uh, that that uh, has worked quite well, especially for common uh, diseases where there's a lot of individuals that can be ascertained who are uh, affected with the disease and can be compared to controls. When looking at a quantitative trait, a population-based study can be used and all members of that population uh, evaluated for a particular trait that um, could range from something that's very easy to measure, such as weight or a height, to something that requires uh, an experiment, such as measuring the gene expression of one gene in the genome or all the genes in the genome. When considering a case control association study, so I'm going to talk about that study design rather than the uh, population-based one. Uh, ideally, the cases and controls are similar and comparable in all aspects of uh, um, um, except for their disease status. If we want to increase the potential genetic component, the potential contribution, enrich the genetic effect size, we might decide to set up that case control association study to try and enrich those cases for having genetic contributions to that trait. We might choose the more severely affected individuals for a given disease or have a requirement that the cases that the people affected with disease have other family members affected with the disease. It makes them maybe more likely to have a genetic contribution than a larger environmental contribution to uh, being affected or choose those with younger age of onset, that may uh, suggest a stronger genetic component. When considering the controls, if we want to enrich the genetic effect size, we may choose to look for lower risk of disease rather than population-based samples. Now, if we do these strategies and try and enrich for the genetic effect size, then we may um, improve our chances of identifying particular variants, although those effect sizes may not reflect what's really going on in the population. And a population-based study would do a better job of really um, reporting, evaluating what the contribution of those variants is. And we want those samples, those controls to be comparable to the cases based on other th um, aspects, age, sex, demographics, other things that may be contributing to uh, risk of disease. One important aspect of making sure that the cases and controls are, uh, are comparable is to consider underlying uh, ancestry or subpopulations within a particular group. So shown here is, say, maybe a matched set of uh, cases and controls, similar numbers of uh, individuals that have different patterns, so the solid, the dots, the, uh, the hat, between those cases and controls. If we have ancestry differences, different subpopulations represented within the cases and controls, um, then that may lead to uh, uh, false positive results. Uh, from that association study. Now, we may try and collect this information from the individuals, especially asking somebody their, uh, what their uh, ancestry is, or we can determine it based on the genotyping data and uh, use that information to uh, cluster the individuals and um, uh, detect their uh, similarities or differences. It may be that we have inadequate ancestry information until we do that genotyping step. So the challenge, if there's a mismatch in those uh, allele frequencies between the subpopulations, is that we may uh, have uh, population stratification, and that can do produce some false positive associations, especially in case control association studies. And so a lot of effort goes into trying to control for uh, those differences to try and um, make sure that the case control association study is uh, performed accurately. 
here's an example of population stratification uh, where the explanation was published um, back here in uh, 1998. The, the, um, a previous study had been done and shown that the uh, particular marker, this IgG haplotype, this DM marker, was associated with uh, type 2 diabetes in a particular uh, community. And uh, the individuals that uh, uh, um, have the marker, where the marker is present, have an age uh, age-related prevalence uh, shown here, and those where the marker was absent have a, a higher age-related prevalence of disease. So it looks like presence of the uh, GM marker is associated with lower prevalence of diabetes in this population. However, that apparent association with diabetes was found to be due to an association between that marker and the amount of uh, heritage of one uh, subpopulation in this, uh, in this group. So based on uh, great-grandparent uh, ancestry, you can see that the prevalence of diabetes increases with the amount of uh, increased uh, Indian heritage here, whereas the prevalence of this marker uh, sharply decreases. And through this and other analyses, they showed that that association was uh, uh, due to that relationship. So strategies to account for or to avoid population stratification uh, one would be to uh, carefully match cases and controls, even potentially at the individual level. Identify a case and then go find an individual from a control population that has the same age, the same uh, sex, the same other uh, aspects of the, um, uh, that may be contributing to the disease. That works well if there are a large number of controls to be choosing from. You may restrict an analysis to one subgroup, define that subgroup as well as possible to try and avoid the possibility that um, there are multiple subgroups contributing differently. You could also use an approach that adjusts for the genetic background. You can take the genotype data and use principal components to infer ancestry and then adjust for those uh, uh, principal components in the association analysis. And finally, some uh, do not use a case control association study per se, but a family-based uh, study design where one can genotype relatives and analyze the transmission of alleles between heterozygous parents to their uh, affected offspring, looking at a transmission a disequilibrium test, a family-based association test, methods I'm not going to talk about today, but are one way to um, uh, perform an association study that's not a case control study. So we've identified the individuals uh, for the study, uh, and now we genotype them for markers spanning the genome. SNP panels are available that have in the, on the order of 10,000 to uh, millions of SNPs. A couple companies that market uh, products uh, for genome-wide association study include Affymetrix and Illumina. These different arrays that can be purchased uh, may contain random SNPs across the genome. They may contain selected haplotype tagging SNPs, and we've talked about this uh, previously in this course, SNPs that are chosen to represent the variation um, uh, uh, across a region. So uh, a SNP, the SNP that is uh, present here, the first column uh, that has a CTCT pattern amongst these four haplotypes is represented by uh, genotyping this variant here that has a TCTC pattern across those haplotypes. If those variants are inherited together in the same pattern across a lot of individuals, one can serve as a proxy for another or a tag for the other. Uh, and using that information across the genome can be helpful to uh, limit the number of variants and use the smartest set of variants to uh, cover as much of the genome as possible. These arrays can also include copy number probes, so not only looking at changes of uh, a nucleotide or not, but uh, uh, whether regions may be uh, deleted or inserted. Arrays and panels are moving towards having more lower frequency variants as they are identified from uh, sequencing studies and are being detected, can be put onto arrays and uh, allow cost-effective uh, analysis. In the past few years, arrays that are uh, focused mostly on variants that are present in the protein coding regions of genes in the exomes are uh, being developed that include a lower range of frequency variants but include the ones that uh, perhaps are easiest to follow up functionally to figure out how they may be playing a role. And some arrays are designed so that the investigator can 
use the framework markers that are present on the array and then also choose their favorite markers that may not be present, that may not be well represented on that array and add to that uh, custom add-on markers to allow a, a most efficient study design for the lowest cost. Two of the assays of how these uh, approaches work. Uh, the Illumina Infinium assay, the whole genome, uh, the genomic DNA from the individual is amplified and fragmented. And then a bead array of capture probes uh, is, is uh, 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 um, purchased. That array has on it um, uh, oligonucleotides that uh, have specific sequences on them. These fragmented gen um, genomic DNA uh, hybridizes to these uh, um, arrays. Shown here is the, uh, the B type and the uh, sequence that's present there, the genomic DNA that hybridizes in a region. And this um, primer, that um, the sequence that extends, ends right before the uh, presence of the, uh, the variable nucleotide that's being assayed. So the template for a short primer extension is provided by the genomic DNA. And um, the, the nucleotide that is um, added on, either the C or the A in this case, are labeled with two different colors so that after uh, performing the, um, the um, uh, chemical reaction and doing uh, some fluorescent staining, you can detect that fluorescent color and its intensity so that the amount of intensity of this color represents uh, how much C nucleotide is present in the individual at that position and the red color is representing how much A nucleotide is present. The Affymetrics axiom um, strategy for uh, doing genotyping. Again, you amplify that uh, DNA and fragment it from the given individuals. Here the capture uh, uh, is performed on an array and a cocktail of labeled um, oligos is added on uh, uh, in, in the reaction and the discrimination is performed by a ligation that will uh, ligate together uh, one oligo with one of these provided oligos if there's a perfect match, a perfect complementarity of the nucleotide sequence uh, at that position. The ligase is very specific for that. Um, you wash off the other nucleotides and then a step of staining and imaging detecting that um, uh, label that is on those oligos and allowing the, uh, again, the intensity of the two different colors representing two different alleles of uh, labels that could be present at that uh, position. The arrays are genome-wide arrays, but what their actual coverage is across the genome can vary. Not every single variant is covered in any of the arrays that are uh, uh, available. So when choosing which array, maybe choosing, you may wish to choose uh, based on what the coverage is of that, of that uh, particular array for the variants that uh, you wish to investigate. So here are some examples of uh, various arrays and the uh, coverage across the genome based on different populations from the HapMap uh, study. And you can see that some uh, have um, moderate coverage up to higher coverage really with more SNPs that are available, more markers on the array allows for higher coverage. But that, that coverage differs uh, between the different populations because the frequencies of the variants are differing between these uh, populations. So the genotype data is generated there are several important steps of quality control to make sure that the data is valid. So one step is looking for identifying and removing bad samples, uh, samples that may have been genotyped. So if a sample is poor quality, maybe we'll detect it because its success rate, the number of the, uh, that sample is successful on less than say 95% of the variants on the array. That might suggest that the sample is lower quality and some of the variants that did succeed in genotyping might be giving erroneous data, so it would be useful to exclude that sample. If the average number of heterozygote calls in that sample is higher than, um, than, than the other samples being assayed, then that might suggest that a sample is contaminated and again that the genotype calls are uh, incorrectly representing a combination of samples. You may be able to identify sample switches by analyzing the data, looking and seeing whether the sample is of the appropriate sex based on markers on the X and Y chromosomes or by comparing genotypes to any previous existing genotypes on those individual samples. There's a lot of sample handling that happens in the genotyping process and uh, can be useful to detect any handling errors. 
may, may identify any unexpected related individuals. People, the same person may have participated in a study twice and can detect that uh, those identical samples are present or, um, or twins or relationships between individuals that were um, not known previously. And the data can be used uh, with that principal component analysis to evaluate um, ancestry based on those allele frequencies across the genome and identify individuals that um, may have much different underlying ancestry than the rest of the sample. It's also a genotype quality control step at the level of the SNP, the level of the variant. If a particular variant has a success rate less than 95 percent, well, maybe that assay is a little bit unstable, and so uh, uh, the genotypes that are called might not be accurate. It might be better to remove that uh, particular SNP. Some duplicate samples are included intentionally to evaluate and determine whether or not uh, the SNP assays are accurate or not. So if there's a high discrepancy rate, then uh, those samples may, should be excluded. Looking at tests of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, whether the expected proportions of the genotypes are consistent with the observed allele frequencies. If there are any family relatedness, family relatives in, um, in a study, such as trios, you can look for trace in, that the um, alleles are inherited properly in those families. And if there's different missing lists, if it's a case control study, maybe the different missingness rate of the cases versus the controls, or if there are other aspects that recognize that the cases and controls perhaps were genotyped differently, um, that may be important to keep track of because it could end up influencing the results um, in the association analysis. Here's an example of uh, the readout of uh, uh, the genotyping assays with the signal intensity of one allele shown on the x-axis and the signal intensity of the other allele shown on the other axis. So for example, at one SNP, we've genotyped several hundred individuals here. Uh, these individuals had high levels of the, um, uh, the X allele and lower levels of the Y allele. These would be homozygotes for that X allele. Here are homozygotes of the Y allele, and here are the heterozygotes. That's a nice uh, example. Sometimes the software that is calling these genotypes and recognizing these clusters uh, um, may accidentally combine two clusters together and call these all as uh, say the heterozygotes and these as those other homozygotes, and you could uh, detect when that kind of thing happens. Sometimes the assay is not really all that, uh, doesn't discriminate that well between the clusters. And then uh, we need to determine whether we can keep this assay and whether we're confident of the genotypes in here or not. Maybe particular samples need to be uh, removed because we're less confident of the genotypes where these clusters overlap. Or perhaps the whole marker should be removed from the analysis. So now we have the genotype data, we have the high quality genotype data, uh, now we can do tests of association. If it's a case control study, we could uh, uh, perform, a, um, evaluate the genotypes uh, and count how many individuals are, are, have the different genotypes between the cases and the controls. Could do a test for trend, uh, could do an analysis that includes other covariates, other things that can be influencing the outcome, the disease. Um, you could do an additive test, that's most commonly performed, but could also do a dominant or a recessive test. When doing an allelic analysis, just looking at presence of the A and C alleles, for example, at a variant, you could count the number of cases, the number of controls, and calculate that odds ratio uh, of the presence of those alleles, and look for whether the, um, the odds of uh, uh, having, um, having disease are uh, increased. An example here of an association study, the odds ratio plot from a number of different studies, um, all looking at the same variant. So we're looking at the odds ratios down here and the value of one, meaning there's no influence of that variant uh, on disease, is uh, shown by this vertical bar. So any given study with references shown over here is represented with a, um, the dot representing what that odds ratio is, the bar representing the 95 percent confidence interval. So some studies, maybe the smaller ones, may have larger uh, confidence intervals, some of which uh, uh, cross over that uh, value of one. Some of the larger studies have more uh, uh, larger sizes of the boxes there and more limited um, uh, confidence intervals. Data can be combined here across populations to show that uh, what the odds ratio is 
here in these different uh, populations and summarize data together. This is a very strongly associated variant from a genome-wide association study, and it had an um, odds ratio of 1.46. And the p-value across all of these studies is quite significant, it's um, 10 to the minus 140th. Now, if looking at a quantitative trait, maybe doing more, uh, say, a linear regression analysis uh, here where the, uh, the, the looking at the um, graph of the uh, different genotypes and your trait of interest and uh, plotting the uh, trait values for the different genotypes and then looking at the, uh, the uh, beta value here representing the slope of uh, this line for this particular SNP. In reality, we'd be including covariates. Uh, if my trait is toe size, then toe size might also be affected by sex, by age. Maybe the relationship between age and toe size isn't completely linear. Maybe my toes get smaller as I uh, uh, become more elderly. Maybe body mass index plays a role. Any significant, any other variable that is significantly associated with toe size, I'd want to include there so that the uh, value that I'm uh, focusing on for the association between the SNP and the trait is uh, most representative of that uh, SNP contribution. Now, we're assuming that the trait is normally distributed for each genotype and has a common variance and that the subjects are uh, independent. And so traits may need to be normalized ahead of time or transformed in some way so that those distributions are, uh, are normal. And uh, if there are not independent subjects, if there are some relatives in the, uh, uh, within the study, then that relatedness needs to be taken into consideration. So collected the samples, genotyped them, uh, performed an association analysis, performed it on every marker that's uh, available and can generate a plot like this where each dot is representing one variant that was uh, evaluated. The chromosomes are lined up end to end here. Here's 1 through 22. And the evidence of association is shown as uh, negative log 10 of the p-value is shown on the y-axis here. So this is a very large study of 188,000 uh, individuals from 60 different studies that combined their data together. And the p-values are quite strong uh, for, um, and exceed up here uh, even more than 10 to the minus uh, 100th for some of these. Often called a Manhattan plot because this is supposed to look like the Manhattan uh, skyline. So if we're going to test many, many variants, uh, use it, the uh, threshold of significance maybe needs to take into consideration that, uh, that number of tests. Testing 300,000 to millions of SNPs, one approach that's used to um, correct for or consider those multiple tests is uh, a Bonferroni correction that's based on uh, considering that a p-value of 0.05 that's maybe more typically applied to a, a, a say, clinical type study. Um, if the number of common variants present in the, uh, at least the European genome, is approximately equivalent to a, uh, a million independent tests, then 0.05 divided by that million is a p-value of 5 times 10 to the minus 8. So this is a commonly applied threshold for declaring that um, an association is significant if it exceeds that uh, level of significance. So if we're going to get to this level of significance, we're going to either need the variant to have a large effect on that trait or a large sample size uh, to be present to, um, uh, to reach that threshold. Two more aspects I want to talk about about the design and analysis of these studies. And one is uh, the ability to impute ungenotyped variants. So in a given array, here's a comparison of two uh, different arrays, um, some of the uh, introductory arrays from uh, Illumina and Affymetrix that had 300,000 and 500,000 variants on them. And each, this is sort of uh, position shown across here for a region of the genome. And the variants present on one array are shown with these black hatches, the other array shown by the red marks. And you can see that there are not that many variants that overlap. In fact, if you looked at the pool of variants on the arrays for those two, it's a small proportion of the exact same variants that are uh, being genotyped. However, given the relationship between variants and the linkage disequilibrium that exists in the human genome, we can predict what the genotypes are at uh, nearby variants that are in high linkage disequilibrium with the ones that are being uh, genotyped. And this process is called imputation. So if we impute, in this case, it's to variants present in the, uh, the uh, 
uh, the hat that were genotyped as part of the HatNav study in a reference sample, we can impute uh, using either of these uh, data sets many of the variants uh, shown here that are a much denser uh, set of variants. Briefly, the way that this works is that uh, I have my given study sample um, with uh, maybe a copy of a portion of a chromosome from mom and a portion of a chromosome from dad. This particular individual is AG at this position, AC at this position, and AA at this position. And then I have a set of reference haplotypes. Maybe they're from the HapMap project or the Thousand Genomes project or my own uh, sequencing study of many, many more individuals in my uh, population of interest. Uh, a reference set of samples where the genotypes are much more dense, so maybe shown here, um, um, many more variants than were observed in my study sample. You could take those observed genotypes and look for the reference haplotypes that are uh, uh, most similar to them and look at the likelihood that uh, these particular alleles are present and uh, on what uh, type of haplotype. This has to do with the frequency of those uh, haplotypes uh, and the presence of those uh, particular alleles. So perhaps the AAA uh, haplotype in this region best matches this uh, purple haplotype here, whereas the GCA doesn't best match any of these haplotypes across the whole region, but is best represented by a portion of a haplotype here and a portion of a haplotype here. That then allows me to impute those missing genotypes or predict those missing genotypes. And the various algorithms that exist for doing imputation uh, usually provide a quality score along with um, each given uh, genotype that's imputed. I may impute a variant that is in extremely high LD with one of my genotyped variants much better than a variant that is, oh, in lowish LD and where I'm counting on the uh, relationship and looking across um, uh, 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 other haplotypes and doing more estimating with less confidence. So what's shown here are uh, uh, SNPs that were uh, directly genotyped on a particular array are shown in red. And this is a uh, uh, test for association with uh, LDL cholesterol in a region of the genome across a few hundred, uh, uh, um, few hundred kilobases here uh, near the LDL receptor gene and then we're looking for association with LDL cholesterol, you can see that none of the red genotyped variants show strong evidence of association with this trait. But when able to impute those ungenotyped variants, uh, variants are identified that show strong evidence of, uh, of association in this individual study. So performing an imputation test to allow a greater proportion of the variants in the human genome to be um, tested for association can increase uh, signals being identified. Now another aspect of doing the uh, association study would be to combine the data together from multiple studies. Maybe I perform a, a study in thousands of individuals looking for association with a disease or a trait and I find some evidence and I publish my paper and, uh, but there's likely more data in there and I'd like to combine that together uh, with others, my, my uh, colleagues who are also uh, generating, doing, performing a similar study. So combining, we'd like to combine that data together uh, giving more weight to studies that have greater precision. Probably that means a study that's larger, that has uh, more subjects in it, uh, deserves a little bit more weight in that uh, combining data than the one that is much, much smaller than it. And this increases our power to detect signals compared to the individual studies alone. We can also use this to investigate the consistency of the effects across the studies and also investigate potential sources of heterogeneity. What are the differences uh, between these studies? Maybe the phenotype difference in how the cases and controls were selected or how the individuals were participated may be a little bit different and we may uh, um, identify uh, uh, some of those differences. Maybe use different genotyping and analysis strategies. The environmental effects on the individuals that are participating in the analysis may differ and we may be able to um, recognize uh, those differences in effect when we test for heterogeneity in the meta-analysis. So some common meta-analysis methods, one is to uh, combine based on uh, p-values and taking into consideration the effect of the variant, is the, vari is the C allele associated with increased uh, trait value or decreased trait value, considering that when uh, combining the data based on their, the p-values for those significance. Or perhaps more commonly an effect size meta-analysis, 
that's using the normalized effects uh, uh, from each of the studies uh, to combine together to um, uh, um, uh, perform that meta-analysis. Combining those effects, we could do a fixed effects analysis where we're assuming that uh, the uh, between study variance is uh, zero, that each of the studies is going to um, be have contributing the same effect size. Or perhaps if we don't believe that assumption to be true, a random effects um, met based meta-analysis. Other methods exist that uh, can incorporate some of the uncertainty uh, in those beliefs and do a Bayesian type analysis. Meta-analysis also offers another chance to adjust for uh, population stratification. And uh, this has been termed uh, genomic control. So shown here in the plot are looking at uh, values of an expected um, uh, uh, effect. Here it's a, uh, from a chi-square test looking for uh, association between uh, alleles. And comparing that to uh, those values that are observed and comparing them for every single variant that is analyzed in the study. And so most of the variants, most uh, in the genome-wide association study are um, going to fit along the normal expectation of uh, the distribution. They show no effect on association and should be falling right along this uh, line of um, uh, identity here. When variants are uh, more significant in the observed study than in, uh, from an expected uh, uniform distribution, then they would rise up off the line. And so these may be representing true signals of association. But if the uh, variants are, if the signals are sort of are rising off this line very early on uh, at lower and lower, uh, less and less evidence of association here, that may be representing, in fact, that there are some population outliers and or structure uh, in the data, maybe, or uh, relatedness between the individuals. So the, uh, the factor by which this um, increase is, um, uh, uh, is present can be calculated, and the results of the tests of association can be adjusted uh, by that factor. And so a study that says that they perform genomic control calculated the factor perhaps for each of the studies being input into the meta-analysis and adjusted those. So if there were lots and lots of relatives and there was a lot of inflation in one study, then those p-values were adjusted be um, to become less significant in that contribution to, uh, to the analysis. So we've set up, we've designed, we've performed our, our uh, genome-wide association study. Let's talk about interpretation of some of the results of these studies. So I'm going to use as an example uh, an analysis that was done with uh, seven individual contributing studies that performed a genome-wide association study, and then a meta-analysis was performed of those studies. And uh, the lead variants were identified and followed up in additional sort of a stage two set of uh, cohorts. So the initial analysis. Uh, was done in almost 20,000 individuals and the follow-up in another approximately 20,000 individuals. And this was a study looking at uh, uh, traits involved in uh, cholesterol and uh, other lipid levels. And the main results are shown here. Here's a full set of results. I'm going to zoom in in a second. But there's a Manhattan plot provided for each of the traits looked at, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. You can see that signals were identified um, across the genome. Um, also shown are these uh, quantile quantile plots, like the one that I uh, uh, just described, where the expected log p value minus log 10 of the p value is shown on the um, x axis and the observed values on the y axis. So I'm going to zoom in on the, a little bit here. So the, um, on a portion of the Manhattan plot, uh, in this case, they colored the loci uh, based on whether that uh, signal had been previously reported in earlier studies or whether it was a novel uh, signal from this paper. And here they also pointed out the ones that they tested in their stage two analysis, but that didn't uh, meet the threshold for uh, significance. Here in this QQ plot, they show this gray line here uh, is shown the, um, uh, the, the sort of the expected results if there's no uh, evidence of association with the confidence interval in this sort of shaded pattern. And the results from all variants in the association test uh, uh, is shown here. And that includes lots and lots of very strongly associated variants. 
So then when they considered the variance, uh, removed the variance and the regions around them that had been shown to be associated previously, uh, the signal is shown here. If they remove the variance that they are then reporting and asking are there additional variants yet to be found associated with this trait, uh, that's the green bars here. And so you can see that, that uh, perhaps there are additional signals that uh, if a larger analysis were performed, a greater meta-analysis, that additional signals may be identified. The results then are often reported in a, a table. This is very small here, but shows a portion of the data for uh, the loci that are found to be associated with LDL cholesterol. So here are four, row, four rows representing four uh, signals that were um, newly identified in the study, and then some of the loci with prior uh, evidence of association with that trait. And the given variance is, is indicated, and uh, results for combining the, result, the data from that initial stage, the uh, genome-wide association study, as well as the follow-up uh, uh, studies that only genotyped a subset of the most significant variants. And combining that data together, uh, they show the, uh, the p-value and the uh, sample size that was present. They also show what the sort of size, came up with a measure for the size of that interval in kilobases and the number of genes that are in that interval. And this is uh, many different ways to sort of define a locus, and this is just one that they represent here. And then labeled some genes of interest that may or may not, but, you know, looked good for potentially playing a role in that particular trait. Now, in this case, to determine, to uh, re reply the, uh, report the effect size associated with each of these variants, instead of using the uh, combination of studies, uh, they chose to use one particular study. Uh, here, the uh, Framington Heart Study that was a population-based study, and so perhaps the effect sizes are uh, most representative, better representative of the population than if we chose only, say, the cases and the controls and the extremes of the population and we're missing sort of uh, the people more in the middle. So they report here that the, uh, uh, the two different alleles and then the effect size for, in this case, the minor allele. So it says that the P allele is associated with increased levels of uh, LDL cholesterol. And this is the, uh, the beta value from the, um, uh, from the regression analysis and it's a standard error. So we can look at the beta value and determine which, whether the allele is associated with increased, if it's positive or decreased uh, levels of that trait. So now for some examples of uh, what the uh, zoomed in association plots look like in particular regions and some of the potential kinds of results that uh, can be observed. So here, zooming in on a portion of uh, chromosome 19, you can see that uh, every dot now representing a, um, a, a variant that was tested for association here, and this was using variants imputed to uh, uh, the HapMap reference panels. And down below are genes in the region, including the APOE gene, known to be associated with LDL cholesterol far before the uh, genome-wide association study era. Also plotted are the recombin is the recombination rate, looking at the rate uh, centimorgans uh, over megabases. So you can see here with this blue line, hot spots of uh, recombination. And so sometimes these hot spots of recombination sort of uh, point out or sort of um, are consistent with the limits of the uh, region of association. So what's found uh, in this case is that we can replicate uh, a known, pre previously known association signal. That's really kind of nice for a study that is uh, uh, quite new to, uh, it's a good positive control when uh, the same signals can, uh, can be identified. But novel signals are uh, perhaps the most exciting, the reason to do the study to identify new things. Some of those studies may be completely localized, may report variants that are completely localized uh, within introns of genes. So these are the strongest associated uh, variants here. You can see the recombination hotspots uh, that are sort of uh, bounding around this region of the variants that are, show that most, the strongest um, evidence of association. Um, none, of the, none of those variants are in coding regions. Many signals are localized outside of known uh, protein coding genes in the genome. So as shown here, a signal, a set of variants uh, in a nice sort of small region, but um, more than 100 kilobases from the closest known protein coding uh, gene. 
And this may be due to a more uh, variance acting uh, at a distance on a protein coding gene, or maybe there's an underlying RNA that is being uh, influenced by the uh, non-coding RNA that's being influenced by the variance. Or maybe there's an underlying protein coding gene that we don't know about yet. At many loci, there are multiple genes in a region, and uh, the process of identifying and determining, suggesting what the most likely influenced gene is, that's uh, uh, done in a paper, uh, often is based on um, looking at the, uh, the uh, genes in the region and looking at the literature and looking at uh, various approaches to try and uh, indicate whether or not the uh, uh, particular genes could play a role. In this case, there are multiple good, when looking at the literature, genes that may be uh, involved in this trait, and this one's HDL cholesterol. And you can see that we're sort of at the limit of what the uh, evidence of association is telling us from this particular study, because there's a whole set of variants that are inherited in very much the same uh, pattern across all those individuals that show very, very similar uh, evidence of association. The lead variant is a tiny bit better, that, uh, strong, more strongly associated than some of these others, but that could be due to just uh, fluctuations in uh, the samples that are uh, contributing here or small changes that uh, may not be significant that uh, the likelihood that this variant itself is the uh, causal variant is not much bigger than the chance that some of these others uh, uh, are playing a role. So really, a set of candidate variants that may be influencing uh, uh, the trait at this locus could be best considered to be including at least this set and maybe this set and maybe even uh, others. It's important to know that uh, to interpret the less loci names with caution, many of the names that are provided to go along with a given variant in a, uh, in a table may just be the closest gene to uh, where the lead variant is that gets reported. So this may be uh, labeled with one of these gene names when uh, these are also in the, in the region. How do we interpret the plausible candidate genes? So here's an, uh, a set of approaches that were done. It was a, a recent paper from uh, the fall of this year reporting signals, loci newly found to be associated with uh, 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 here all HDL cholesterol levels. And in this table, they report what the nearest gene is to the lead variant, uh, how far away that nearest gene is. So in this case, the nearest gene was 13 and a half kilobases away. Many, uh, in many of the examples here, the, uh, the variant that was the lead variant is within the bounds of the gene, either an exon or, or an intron. How many genes are within an arbitrary distance here, 100 kilobases? So you can have a sense of how gene rich or gene poor uh, a given region is. And then uh, approaches to try and sort of guess or estimate um, provide some sort of sense of how to interpret that result. Uh, one approach is to go look at the literature of all of those genes in this region, maybe even at greater distances, and try and say, well, which ones have a plausible role in lipid analysis or, or HDL levels or have some piece of data from a model organism or their biochemical function that may be known that might suggest that they're good candidates for this trait. Another approach is to take all of those candidate variants and ask, uh, are any of the lead variants, and this might be done by taking the top variant and looking at the, those that are in linkage disequilibrium at an R squared level greater than 0.8, and asking whether any of them change the protein uh, coding sequence of any of the nearby genes. So which genes have a non-synonymous variant in them? You can see that uh, in this top case here, there are three genes uh, that uh, have non-synonymous variants. These asterisks mean the two of them are a little further, uh, further distant uh, away. Um, in other cases, there's a single non-synonymous variant that's been shown to have a functional effect on that uh, particular protein, and so that might be a stronger piece of evidence than uh, some of the others. Because not all non-synonymous variants affect functions of genes, some of them um, are silent. Another approach is to look for uh, whether the variant that is associated with the trait, such as HDL cholesterol, is also associated with expression of a nearby uh, gene. So that's termed an EQTL, an expression QTL. So in this particular case, uh, the variant that is uh, associated with HDL cholesterol at this locus is also associated with the expression of the RBM5 gene. So 
uh, making up the alleles here, maybe the A allele that's associated with increased HDL cholesterol may also be associated with increased expression of RBM5 that might provide stronger evidence that RBM5 is uh, involved in the uh, HDL cholesterol levels. An important aspect of interpreting these studies is to figure out whether the variant that is most strongly associated with RBM5 in that region is inherited together with that, uh, the HDLC associated variant or not. Sometimes these uh, lookups can be just variants that are in modest or low LD with some other <coughs> variant that is driving expression of that gene. And finally, approaches are being developed uh, and, and used that look at the genes in, that are present at multiple um, of the identified loci, take them together, and look for whether um, particular pathways are uh, represented that might suggest that a gene in, at one locus, a gene at another, a gene at a third, all together work in the same pathway, then perhaps those are the more likely affected genes than ones that are unrelated to the other uh, loci. A given locus doesn't necessarily just have one signal uh, of association. Here's an example. The same uh, association plot is shown uh, twice here, but it is colored based on uh, the linkage disequilibrium with a lead variant over here. And you can see that these variants are uh, uh, inherited often together. Lead variant is a p-value of 10 to the minus 15. And the same thing is true for these variants over here, that these are inherited um, uh, in a similar pattern, but that there's not a lot of linkage disequilibrium between these two uh, signals, even though they're relatively close together uh, uh, near this gene. So here, this, uh, this interval is overlapping and variants are present at the promoter of the LIPC gene, whereas these variants are a little bit further upstream. These signals appear to be independent, suggesting that if there are two underlying variants or more that are uh, contributing to uh, expression or function of that gene. It makes a lot of sense that there could be allelic heterogeneity for complex traits. We know it's true for single gene disorders. There are a lot of variants that are present in a given uh, BA, BRCA1 gene that can lead to breast cancer. In a similar way, we'll likely be identifying many different variants that can be um, influencing the expression or the function um, of a g given gene to influence a complex trait. As studies increase in size, especially meta-analysis studies that are having increased power to detect signals, uh, we're identifying more and more uh, loci where uh, more than one signal uh, appears to be present. One way to uh, calculate this or to uh, uh, declare whether or not uh, it appears to be more than one signal is to uh, perform a conditional analysis. So taking, for example, that same linear regression uh, equation, but now including uh, two SNPs uh, in the analysis and asking uh, whether for a given trait of interest, uh, whether the lead variant, including the lead variant, say, of each of those two signals, again, with the covariates included, if this uh, beta value for this SNP changes when this one is included in the model, then it suggests that this variant is sometimes inherited with the other one and that uh, those signals are not necessarily independent, but may be contributing uh, together. If neither of those betas changes in the reciprocal tests, if looking at the, uh, the B1 value when B2 is included uh, and, this, and the same, if neither of those values changes, then the two SNPs appear to be independently affecting the trait. So that's the clearest situation of being able to say multiple independent variants are affecting the trait. The variants may not necessarily be independent. Some of them are going to be dependent on each other. The, um, this will be perhaps harder to define and, and explain, but is likely um, reflecting really how variants influence genes. Another approach to uh, narrowing a, uh, a signal when performing an association study is to uh, look across populations. So here is an example of um, a meta-analysis performed uh, using individuals of European ancestry and with the strongest evidence of association. This is an HDL locus uh, near, uh, distant from uh, this gene here. Uh, and you can see sort of a plateau of the most significantly associated uh, variants, whereas a study of a approximately similar sample size of 
individuals um, uh, who, who uh, describe themselves as African Americans has a narrower uh, evidence of association. The same or very similar lead variant uh, across these studies, but if we assume that it's the same underlying variant at this locus across the two, then maybe the, uh, the population uh, history and the um, is that there was a, a greater recombination events, more recombination events that limited uh, the region that is still showing evidence of association uh, in this population compared to this one, and it can help us localize uh, the underlying signal. Taken together, uh, genome-wide association studies have identified many variants for many different traits. The, the amount of the trait variation that's been explained by those variants differs by, uh, by trait. You can see shown here are a number of different uh, traits or diseases, and the heritability that's been estimated based on pedigree uh, studies, and the heritability of uh, the, the, that can be explained by uh, the GWAS traits included in this uh, particular analysis, particular uh, summary. So for some traits, the, the genetic variants that have been identified are uh, explaining a larger proportion of the, uh, the, the heritability, especially true here, perhaps because the HLA locus plays such a strong, has such a strong contribution to type 1 diabetes risk. Many traits, it's much more modest, the percent of the trait variation that's been explained so far uh, by these common variants. So the use of that information. Uh, is going to be uh, disease dependent. So now I'd like to turn to sort of the uh, current and future uh, use of looking at some of the lower frequency variants that perhaps were not included uh, in genome-wide association study analyses performed previously. Now part of this has to do with the design of the uh, arrays that uh, have been used, that they tended to include variants that were common in the population. Uh, so the lower frequency variants perhaps were not included, perhaps are less easily able to be imputed based on uh, reference panels, and are better being identified by uh, ongoing sequencing studies. So in addition to uh, genotyping analyses for complex traits, whole exome sequencing and whole genome uh, sequencing are being performed. Variants in, are being identified and genotypes called across these sequencing studies. Uh, si similar to uh, genotyping-based studies, imputation uh, can be performed. And using lower frequency variants, the same analysis could be performed, a single point association analysis, take each variant and one at a time ask whether it's associated with uh, disease or not. Given that sequencing is still uh, uh, expensive for very large studies, uh, the results may not be uh, significant and may require a larger level of uh, replication. And in this case, you could go follow up the particular variants that showed suggestive evidence of association here. But another approach uh, is to combine the data across uh, variants together at a locus, where different variants may be present in different individuals, but together help implicate that particular gene in uh, association with the trait. If you're looking at different variants in different individuals, then yes, you could follow up those, in those variants, but you may also want to sequence that particular gene in additional individuals to find out what new variants those individuals may carry that uh, you didn't know about in the initial study. So some sequencing study designs for complex traits, and I have examples of a couple of these. One is. Uh, to sequence selected individuals, say choose those that have extreme trait values uh, from the very top of the distribution and uh, to sequence those individuals and choose those at the very bottom of the uh, uh, distribution, maybe expecting you might identify uh, specific variants that are driving uh, disease uh, with larger effects in those individuals, and so uh, even though they are rare across the population, they are having a stronger effect either increasing or decreasing a trait value in those individuals. Really larger number of individuals may need to be identified to get a significant result. 
if the variance is low frequency, it's going to take more and more individuals to observe it enough times to have confidence uh, in the effect of that uh, particular variant. So increasing the number of individuals assayed, one way could be to um, decrease the sequencing coverage, say not uh, use all of the reads to get very high confidence genotypes in um, uh, every single individual, but use uh, fewer reads per individual so more individuals can be assayed, uh, perhaps with some lower confidence, but that larger sample size to uh, still call the, uh, the variant, identify the individuals, find more people that uh, have a particular variant to test. Another approach to increase the number of individuals is to uh, sequence, uh, um, sequence one um, a sample and then choose the variants that are identified, take those variants, collect them together uh, onto a genotyping array that can be used um, perhaps more cost effectively in many, many more individuals to increase the sample size by following up the sequencing by doing uh, genotyping. It also may be useful to sequence population isolates where the frequency of, of variants that are rare otherwise have drifted to higher frequency and may be more easily detected. So a couple of examples. Here's one of, of uh, sequencing at the extremes of uh, uh, body mass. So uh, in this study, they sequenced the coding regions and splice junctions of uh, 58 uh, different genes, and they chose uh, 379 individuals with a very high average body mass index and a similar number of individuals with a lower uh, body mass index. And they found a number of uh, new variants that hadn't been identified previously, including uh, eight in this particular gene, MC4R gene, one that was known previously to play a role in obesity. Um, they then subsequently tested those variants for function to try and have uh, greater confidence that a uh, variant that was being detected, identified, was it really influencing how this uh, gene acted. So the variants are shown here, uh, whether they were known previously or whether they were novel, and their effects on uh, the uh, the uh, uh, functional studies that they did, a uh, summary of those uh, uh, here. So what they showed is that some of these rare variants that had not been previously identified uh, had functional effects and that this approach could be used to identify other variants that perhaps collected together across individuals uh, would help us identify and implicate a given gene. could also do sequencing um, of additional individuals, say, at a locus identified by a genome-wide association study. So this may be like positional candidate genes based on the position from the, uh, from the GWAS study. And to sequence those, th those uh, regions in cases and uh, in controls or in the um, uh, other uh, individuals with extreme trait values and look for variants that uh, are present only in one group. Uh, compared to the other, with the idea that perhaps finding even one sort of smoking gun, obvious functional uh, variant that has a strong effect could implicate one gene in that locus region compared to uh, the many others. So in this strategy, it may not be the variant that's underlying the association study, but some other variant that influences the gene that helps implicate what, what gene may be uh, present at the GWAS locus. That might be easier than identifying a variant that maybe has a more modest effect that's common in the population that's really underlying the GWAS locus. So an example shown here is uh, uh, for type 1 diabetes. This group did a sequencing study following up on loci that had been identified uh, from a GWAS for type 1 diabetes, and one of the genes uh, here is this um, IFIH1 gene. They resequenced the exons and splice sites of 10 uh, candidate genes, and they used uh, pools of DNA from patients and, uh, and controls, and then uh, took the variants that they identified in this strategy and tested them for evidence of association in more than 30,000 subjects. This is a paper published in uh, 2009. So their strategy for uh, decreasing the cost of the sequencing was a uh, pooling of DNA. Variants that they identified include a couple uh, critical splice site variants, uh, first nucleotide into the intron, uh, uh, into intron 8, intron uh, 14. Here's a stop code, a nonsense uh, variant that was identified 
uh, and then a couple uh, non-synonymous substitutions. And they test these in uh, the uh, much larger sample sizes. Shown here is a, um, a given variant, and uh, here are pairs of rows of how frequent it was in their type 1 diabetes cases, so a frequency of uh, minor allele frequency of 1.1%, and in uh, 9,000 controls, a frequency of 2.2%, so 8,000 to 9,000 uh, individuals. And so this particular variant is associated with a reduced risk of uh, type 1 diabetes and uh, has a p-value of 10 to the minus 14. Similar here, here the splice variant, uh, the uh, stop codon and this other splice variant had frequencies of 1 to 1.5% one uh, uh, values around half of a percent, other values below 1% uh, in terms of how often they had been uh, identified in even these uh, large numbers of, of uh, individuals. In all cases, all four of them, the variants that were identified uh, uh, had lower, were identified more frequently in the controls than the cases. These variants are appearing to be uh, protective uh, from type 1 diabetes, some with stronger evidence of association uh, than others. And here's also an example where they compare the results of a case control study to one of those family-based uh, association tests where they're looking at the number of transmitted to non-transmitted alleles and the relative risk uh, in additional individuals here. So they use this data to implicate that variants in IFIH1 can influence risk of type 1 diabetes. They're decreasing. These rare variants are decreasing risk of disease, but show evidence then that, uh, that it's possible to sort of implicate that, that uh, particular gene at this locus uh, as playing a role in disease. Now, many individually important variants like those may be too rare to detect uh, for association in the trait. Um, however, they could be uh, important when taken all together. So tests are being developed, statistical methods are being developed that allow these variants to be grouped together uh, in an association test. These are called uh, burden tests or maybe gene-based tests. And uh, the approaches are to combine the information from multiple variants, so shown here, many chromosomes from uh, individuals affected with disease where the X's are representing uh, uh, given variants. We have a candidate gene down here that spans this region. So some of the variants are present uh, within the candidate gene. Some maybe are present nearby. Some of them are common, shown uh, by these uh, vertical bars, where others are uh, rare, only found in fewer individuals. So gene-based tests are combining, can be used to combine the information from the multiple variants into a single test statistic to use um, as the predictor in the association test. Now, one of the challenges and one of the differences between uh, the methods is, is how, uh, what information about the variants uh, to use. So some tests will focus or will choose the variants um, um, excluding the most common variants because those perhaps are less likely to be having a stronger functional effect on the, uh, the underlying gene, so they might exclude these ones here that are rare, and use a threshold and say, uh, I'm going to combine variants together uh, in a gene or in a gene region where the frequency is less than 3% or 1% or less than a half a percent. So it depends how big that initial study is, what that threshold uh, can be. And then maybe choose some annotation of those variants uh, and choose an annotation that is uh, suggesting that it's a more functional effect. So maybe not include variants that don't change the protein sequence, but include the ones that, uh, that are loss of function or that are uh, um, changing, the, maybe non-synonymous, changing the protein sequence with the idea that one of those maybe plays a more, a, has a stronger effect on an individual and could be responsible in that individual. So develop a test that then selects sets of variants to uh, ask together whether that set of variants is more often found in the cases compared to the controls uh, or vice versa. And some tests will include allow variants to both increase risk of disease or decrease risk of disease. Others are based on the assumption that all such variants would uh, act in the same direction to increase or decrease risk. 
So there are many alternative forms. This is a very active area of, uh, of research and um, uh, different approaches being used that essentially all together are collapsing information into a single test. Um, and the choice of variants that are included is really, can have a very big impact on the test. So if we include variants that um, don't have an effect, too many null variants can really uh, reduce the statistical power so that we end up not identifying a significant result even if many other variants uh, um, do have a functional effect. So filtering, choosing which variants to include based on, on frequency and predictive function are the most commonly applied approaches at this point. I think time will tell what the, uh, what the approaches are that uh, most usefully identify novel genes influencing uh, disease susceptibility or a trait based on different variants being present in different individuals. So together, genome-wide association studies, common variants or rare variants, found, variants found from sequencing uh, used for association studies, um, all can lead to the identification of susceptibility variants for uh, common and complex traits. The most biggest utility of these variants may be the novel biological insights uh, for the trait or disease of interest. When we identify a locus that is uh, not near any gene known to play a role in uh, disease, then we have the potential to learn a huge amount about other types of genes, pathways that may be involved in disease that may identify um, uh, and lead to clinical advances such as new targets for uh, drugs or other biomarkers to be able to detect and predict uh, disease maybe even leading to prevention. It's also possible that identifying the particular variants together can help in uh, improving an individual's uh, uh, response, especially if it's a response to a particular drug or uh, um, uh, ability. The future of complex trait analyses from using genome-wide association studies and sequencing, more and more loci are continuing to be identified. The proportion of the heritability that can be explained by variants known to date is still relatively modest, and so there are many more discoveries yet to come. Larger and larger meta-analyses are identifying uh, more and more of these signals. There's deeper follow-up now of the signals that are identified to try and understand what the uh, underlying variants in genes are. Studies are being performed in more diverse populations. The allele frequency is different, the environmental contributions differ, and the genetic variants that uh, may play stronger roles uh, in different populations will all lead to identifying uh, uh, the biological basis for disease. We'll see more and more of these gene-based tests from the rare variants and more of the studies that are identifying loci being used to look for gene-gene uh, and gene-environment interactions that may uh, better explain the overall contributions to disease. And we have a, a lot of work to be done for all those loci that are being identified to understand what the molecular and biological mechanisms are for how these uh, DNA variants are contributing to uh, disease and trait variability. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>